just got a phone call from Ferrari. Our gasket set that we just ordered actually showed up. I wanna get over there and grab that gasket set as quickly as possible because, well, in the past, some manufacturers say it's a complete engine gasket set, but it isn't actually a complete engine gasket set, and it might be missing a few very important items. And also for the price, it was about $1,100, which is insanely cheap for Ferrari parts. I'm worried that it might actually not have head gaskets in there. There might be some other very critical parts that are missing in that kit because of the price point. And we know that that was the last gasket set that they had in the US. So I'm worried about the other parts that we might need to source. I'm also doing some measuring on the engine block and measuring the bores. And I'm checking these cylinders out here and it looks like they are a bit warped. That's worrying me because the cylinders in here are only two millimeters thick. The pistons that we want to get are a half a millimeter bigger than factory, which means that this is gonna get cut down and only be 1.75 millimeters thick. So we're taking more material off of already thin cylinder wall. That's not ideal for a boosted engine. So I wanna see if they can get the cylinders, how much they are, what the time frame is for getting them. But either way, we gotta go to Ferrari to find out. Yep, so if you guys can see behind me, there's a big hole where a trailer used to be. We also had the Ram truck over there. We had the van. Well, those aren't here now. Those are all gone. The only thing we have left to drive is the Hummer. I don't know. That's not a terrible thing. At least we have a Hummer to drive. Yeah. I brought my Cayman. No, 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 no. Mike, I'm let me driving. Drive. I'm Mike, driving. You gotta let me You're drive. not driving. Nope. It'll go so well, I promise. I'm so well, I promise. This thing's Mike. like 10 times bigger than your Civic. That is true. That's not gonna work. And my uh, my EV <laughs> rental car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we need to we need to drive something that burns real fuel. Yeah. I brought my Cayman, but it only holds two people, so the Hummer it is. All right, starter up. Remote right, start. Remote start. Let's see. Just for the sake of it. Oh. There we go. A little diesel preheat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. I'm willing to bet that this thing has barely any fuel, if any. I think you're probably right. <laughs> yeah, you know? Let's find out. Fine, man. This is like the biggest car with no room inside of it. Yeah, for real. <laughs> like, what's going on here? It's so cramped. Mike, it's not, it's not on, right? <laughs> nope. Uh, it says we have some fuel. I don't know if that's uh, it's not a gauge that I would trust, though. <laughs> All right, now it's working. Can you see off the back there? <laughs> see, we got a spare tire back there. That's about it. This thing seriously needs a backup camera. David said that this car is a bit of a handful at speed, and he's right. We're going like 70, 65 miles an hour right now. And as we get closer to 70, the thing just starts wandering around like crazy. There's so much slop with those tall tires and in the steering box or whatever. It's like, it just wanders around in between the lane. And this thing's so wide. It's like over the line, over the line, over the line. And we're back. You think they're happy to see you, Mike? Of course they are. One of their biggest, biggest spending customers. We spent a thousand dollars here the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's that's really bringing it home around here. Yeah, exactly. That yeah, might have everything. It's it's, it's a, a big, big box. box. Let's see. Well, Mike, Mike, oh, Mike, I want to keep the tape, dude. It's Mike, Mike, <laughs> Mike. Mike. <laughs> Gaskets. Looks like a head gasket. No, that's an intake manifold also. It's like uh, just for the side ones. Oh. And there's a head gasket. One. The other one in there. Is this half a gasket? <laughs> <laughs> that looks like a brush cover gasket. Is that way it might be under? There's two pieces. Okay. Okay, oh. yeah. <laughs> two head gaskets. The two intake manifold gaskets. And then the lower intake and the exhaust. And behind door number two, we have... Looks like a bunch of O-rings. A bunch of O-rings, little tiny ones. It looks like everything is actually there, which is awesome for $1,000 for a Ferrari. That is pretty insane for a V12. I think the gasket set for the BMW engine that I used to run in S54 was like $900 from the dealer. So pretty close. And that's only a six cylinder, one head gasket, one valve cover gasket. So it's actually a pretty good deal from Ferrari. Oh, it's pulling in right now. Woo-wee. That's awesome. It's pretty 
sick. Also, this 355, so. I really like the older cars. I like the styling of them. I like the little more boxed kind of look. That's a very clean one. It's lowered. The wheels look good on it. It's a nice car. I would definitely drive that. See if this thing will even fit in here. What All a right. great truck. Exactly. <laughs> Good news, we got the gasket set and it looks like it's got everything that we need to reassemble the engine. The bad news is that in Italy, they take a break, so they won't be back for another, I think he said three weeks. And then we can put the order in for the cylinders and it'll take about three weeks from there to get the cylinders. The other thing that is not great is that the cylinders are $10,000 for 12 cylinders. Just the cylinders, just the steel pieces that slide into the block. That is absolutely insane. I've gotta to talk to Damon and Dave about that and kind of give them the options. We may have to just take the block over to a machine shop and have them measure it and maybe hone it out to get the cylinders round again and then measure it and then see how much wall thickness we have left. If we can get away with machining them down just a quarter of a millimeter instead of a half a millimeter, that might work. But pistons, they can make it any size, but the rings, they can't. So the rings are off the shelf rings and they have an 84 or a 94 millimeter and then a 94 and a half millimeter that they know of for sure. They're gonna have to check and see if they have that quarter millimeter oversize. And if they do, we might be in good shape. If they don't, that might cost us another $10,000 and another six, seven weeks before we can even get the cylinders. We're gonna have to figure this out. Mark, you got a package. Dude, don't tell me it's- what? Give it to- Tim, <laughs> give it to me! Okay, okay. I think this is my package from Manscaped. Yep. Here we go. I'm pumped because we just got two new incredible grooming tools from Manscaped to help keep you and me both looking sharp and stylish. The Handyman and the Beard Hedger. Let's start with the Beard Hedger. This trimmer right here is an incredible game changer for all beard enthusiasts out there. The Beard Hedger features a titanium coated stainless steel T-blade that effortlessly glides through your facial hair, delivering precise and clean cuts every time. With its 20 different length settings ranging from 0.5 to 10 mil, selected using its convenient Convenient zoom wheel on the front of the beard hedger. You have full control over your beard style. And check this out. The beard hedger has a powerful lithium ion battery that has 60 minutes of runtime. Worried about water damage? Don't be! The beard hedger is waterproof. The beard hedger comes with everything you need. An AC adapter and USB-C cable, perfect for on the go. And when you need a more close and smooth finish, grab the handyman. Just like the beard hedger, the handyman is also waterproof, making cleanup quick and easy. The handyman is completely airplane friendly. It's compact size and long battery life make it the perfect on the go grooming companion. The handyman comes with 60 minutes of runtime on a single charge. Another great feature is the skin safe technology, which is designed to help reduce nicks and cuts. No cuts. So what are you waiting for? Well, go to manscaped.com slash DDE and use code DDE at checkout to get 20% off plus free shipping when you get the handyman and the beard edger at manscaped.com slash DDE. You're gonna lay everything out and kind of catalog everything and make sure we have everything that we need because there is no parts list inside the box. And since I don't know these engines that well, this is the first one I've ever torn down. I just wanna spend a minute, check everything, and make sure that we really do have every part that we're gonna need. Got everything laid out here. Exhaust gaskets, these are the EGR valve gaskets, which are just block off plates now. We have the lower intake manifold gaskets. We have the upper intake plenum gaskets. We've got the head gaskets, front cover gaskets, and then we have all of these little O-rings that go on each and every single one of the studs for the oil pan. Clip O-rings here, That these might actually be cam seals. I think these go on the end of the cams. They look like a Teflon seal. And then there's a bunch of just miscellaneous plates that are on the engine, this is one of those gaskets. A random O-ring, I'm not sure what that's for yet. A bunch of little small gaskets too that could be for the head studs. Yeah, little bits of valve cover gas. So these are valve cover gaskets here. Another part on top of the valve covers. These are for all of the spark plug holes. So each spark plug has a basically a thick O-ring between the valve cover and the head. These are actually the O-rings that go in between the aluminum block and when the cylinders slide in, they seal them up. So this was on the quote that he gave me. So these gaskets alone here, just these O-rings, 
$200. When they put all of this together, they reduce the price by a lot because if this is $200, usually head gaskets are at least $200 a piece. Overall, pretty good deal. And I think that everything is here. We have 74 days left to try to complete this F12 project, running and driving and spinning tires at SEMA show in Vegas. You guys know that's insane. I know it's insane. To get it done, I need to get some specs over to CP Carrillo, who we visited yesterday, gave them a stock piston and connecting rod so they can reverse engineer it and build us the pistons that we need and also the rods that we need for this engine that are gonna be able to handle the 1500 horsepower plus that we're aiming to make. But to do that, like I said, I need to give them some specs. I need to measure the volume inside of the head. Inside of this head, there's the chamber for each cylinder. I've made this plate, so it's just a piece of Lexan, cover this up and there's a hole there. So what I'm gonna do is put a spark plug in the head and then fill this chamber up with fluid and measure how much fluid goes into it to give us the cc's, the cubic centimeters of volume inside of the head. And with that information, as well as the height of the piston coming out of the block, I can give those specs to CP Carrillo and they can calculate the factory compression ratio and also what they'll need to do to the new pistons to make them the correct compression ratio that we're looking for now that we're going to have this thing, a properly built engine for a twin turbo setup. All right, so here is how much the valve is sticking out past the surface of the head. So you can see it's flush there. Then as I come on there, we have like a millimeter gap. This is the recesses for that. So this will fit on there. All right, so Tim is getting the spark plug installed because this actually takes up some volume, very little, but it also plugs up the hole here. Another hole that we're gonna have to plug up is the direct fuel injection port. That's gonna have to get filled in because this will actually get welded up and blended down. And to do that temporarily, I'm just gonna use a piece of clay. So I'm gonna push clay into there and then smooth it out with a razor blade and kind of form it into the shape that it will be uh, when we have it welded and blended. So we get a very accurate reading of the volume of this chamber. So in efforts to give CP Corello as much information as possible to make sure that the pistons are designed as best as they can be to, for our application, I'm gonna give them the depth between the surface of the head and where the tip of the spark plug is. Probably won't matter because we're going down in compression ratio. This engine from the factory has 13.7 to one compression ratio, which is actually very high even for a normally aspirated car. They're able to get away with that because it's direct fuel injection and the fuel sprays directly into the cylinder when the piston is almost all the way up at the top. So if you have fuel coming in through the intake valve when the piston is moving down and basically sucking the air and the fuel in, now you have a mixture of air and fuel in the cylinder that's being compressed together. And if there's hot spots in the cylinder, on top of the piston, on top of the head, whatever it might be, you can have pre-ignition, which is basically just a hot spot in the engine that's creating an explosion because of the air and fuel. And when that happens, that's pinging. Bad cases of it are detonation and you can blow engines up very quickly. Really high compression ratio ignites the mixture better. It forces basically creating more power and more torque. But when you have a turbocharged application, you're gonna be pushing tons of air into the cylinder, so you don't need as high of compression ratio. All of these little details make a huge difference in the end of how the engine runs, match turbo sizing, all of this stuff is just so important to get right. We have some clay from Italy, of course. This is a Ferrari. All right. I'm pretty happy with that. I think that'll do for our measurements. So make sure that this plate goes on, just touches the clay. We'll set up the fluid that we're gonna use. I usually use brake cleaner or acetone uh, with a little bit of transmission fluid because it's red and it just is easy to see. But I don't know if we have any transmission fluid here. So I'll go dig through the cabinets real quick and see what we have to work with. We have a lot of uh, really random stuff here. Double clutch transmission fluid, that'll work. We'll fill this up to the top. And then as we fill the chamber and we'll be able to measure the volume of the chamber really easily. So I'm sure there's other ways that you could do it, but with this tool, it just makes things a lot easier and a lot more precise than just pouring fluid in that you've measured in a measuring cup or something like that. And I don't think these are very expensive anyway. So if you are building an engine and you are blueprinting an engine, which is basically taking all the measurements, not just assembling it, then this is a tool that you'd want to have. All right, we'll fill the rest up with acetone, make it a little thinner. 
I'm having fun finger painting over here. How's your project going? I made the 720 because they were designed after a great white shark. <laughs> <laughs> the resemblance is uncanny, Mark. Look at that. So I've got some assembly lube down here between the head and the Lexan plate that I made to help seal it up. And we are ready to pour the fluid in and get a measurement and see how many cc's of volume this chamber holds. Science. Science. All right. We are full. That looks like it's right at 29 or it's 28.8. CC. All right, so now that we're done measuring the volume of the head, start reassembling the block. Basically put the crankshaft back in, put a piston and rod back in, take some measurements there, figure out all the other information that we need to get off the block. So as I was taking the piston rings out, you can see the pieces of metal that are embedded into the side of the piston and you can feel them like they're protruding out quite a bit. That's what I was worried about with all of those little metal shavings that were inside of the intake manifold that we saw when we pulled the intake manifold off. So all those bits did make it down into the engine, into the combustion chamber. On top of the head, there were a couple spots with a couple dings where the top of the piston and a piece of material went in between and got smashed into the head. So it wasn't terrible yet, but those spots on the head can basically create a low spot and that also creates a high spot and it's a very sharp edge that can create a heat point and that heat point can cause detonation, almost acting like a glow plug in a diesel or like a spark plug that's already fired and it is just igniting that mixture before you want it to. Well, there we go. There is top dead center. Let me hold this in place so I can check the difference between this and see how high the top of the piston is coming out of the bore. We put the crankshaft all the way up at top dead center, so piston number one is as far out as it goes, and we are just under one millimeter uh, in the center of the piston here, so it's about 0.8 seven millimeters. Now I can give that spec to CP so they know the top of the piston on this piston sticks out almost a millimeter and then they can design the piston that they're gonna make for us off of these dimensions. Now I'm also going to just do a compression ratio check on this because we already know the volume of the head, the piston's in here, it'll only take a couple minutes and then we'll see what the actual compression ratio on this engine was before it was torn down. Okay, so now we're zeroed and we're gonna count, I'm gonna get five turns on here so we can get down a half a millimeter. One, two, three. You guys hear that? Yeah. Who is that? Mark, don't make him lose count. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta do it again. No! Mark. Is that two already? <laughs> Mark, you counting? Two. <laughs> 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 who is it? <laughs> I wonder who it could be. All right, we're closing up for the day. Let me, uh, let me drop the shop door. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is this, bro? I, I, I would call this a box, but I can't. Because it's a Porsche. But the paint job looks rough. Are you guys ready for the hurricane? Yeah, free car wash. That's what I'm, no, your car's gonna be in the air. <laughs> and it's gonna land way over there. Did you see this thing? Dude, it's coming in like no joke. Yeah, I said it was like 140 mile an hour. 1939. Like the last time California had a hurricane warning. And I remember it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was funny. Up, yeah, that's how old he is. Get it? Get it? That's how old he is. Working on F12 motor. Are you? Yeah. Progress. Some of us have work, Garrett. Right, right, right. Yeah, so we, we're seeing how much the piston sticks out oh. of a block because we have to have <laughs> custom pistons made. Okay. Yeah. Why is it why is it pink? Uh, that's some assembly lube, so I'll wipe it off after, but it'll basically create a seal around there when we fill it with fluid to measure how much volume. Don't act like some of you don't have the same questions. I'm just helping those of you that have those questions. <laughs> because I know all of this. <laughs> Mike's having a hard time. He needs to maybe an extra hand kind of counting this year. Do you think you could help us out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's pretty good. But, uh, yeah, so there's one, one turn. Three. 
four. Just a little less, right? There we go. No, it was like more here. Well, we started when we started there. I think I think that's. Let me make sure that we're low. That's five turns, so that's five millimeters down. I think it was a little too flat. Uh, hey Garrett, what are you working on, bro? A rock stack. Never been there. And the skill over here has just gone up up a notch. You ever been notch. walking on a trail? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We now have the piston down enough to where the piston is below the deck of the block and I'm able to fill that up with fluid and measure the volume just like we did on the head. But with the piston being moved down, we're gonna have to take that five millimeters that we moved it down and put it into our math formula to basically tell us the negative space that this piston is going to take up. With but fluid? With fluid. What kind of fluid? This is a custom mixture of DCT fluid and acetone. Brilliant. I would so, never thought of that. Yeah, you know, I so I, that I like learned one of those this nineteen thirty nine thing. Yeah, back yeah. in the day before they had the internet. Yeah, I learned this in a book. <laughs> I'm doing this not because we actually need this information, but I'm just curious. So we take the engine apart and we measure it, and it's like 9.8 to 1 instead of 10.2. We're giving up horsepower there. Basically shave the block and shave the heads to get the compression ratio exactly to what the factory says it is, because that's legal. That's like blueprinting the engine, making it exactly to the specs of what it says. Every engine that I've checked is always less than what it's stated hmm. in the manufacturer's like book. And that's why he gets paid what he gets paid. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are right at 43 cc. So obviously that number is gonna be very different once we take up for um, the five millimeters that we lowered the piston. So it's gonna be quite a bit less. It could actually be a negative space um, depending on the shape of the top of the piston. So some of the parts on the piston are higher, some are lower. So we'll have to see what it actually comes out as. I'm gonna go do the math, figure it out. The numbers are in. So it's 13 and a half to one is what it's stated on Ferrari's website. So what do you think? Is it over, under? Under, I think 13 one ish. I think it's it's over what 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 they say. I think 13 seven ish. 12.9. 12.82. Oh! Yep. Wow. So it's quite a bit under. That's low. That's a big difference. Yeah. So they're difference. they're taking power away from you is what you're saying. We also measured the the head without the direct fuel injection, covered it up with clay, which is actually making the volume a bit smaller. So if we put the fuel injector in there and tested it with the factory fuel injector, there'd be a bigger gap. So it would hold more volume, which would mean the compression ratio would be lower. Now that we've figured out all those calculations, we've got all the dimensions sent off to CP Carrillo so they can start designing the pistons for this engine. It is time to get back to the chassis, figuring out where the radiator is going to go. Now we're not going to leave the radiator in the front of the car. We're going to move it to the back of the car. We also need to figure out our fuel cell location and dimensions. How big of a fuel cell can we put in the car? It all depends on the placement in the chassis. So to figure that out, I've got to get the the differential mounted into the subframe and put the subframe basically back in the car and see where I have room to mount everything. Without that in the car, I can't really be sure that my fuel cell will fit in the location I want to put it in. Last time when we looked at the diff in the subframe, we still had the original fuel tank in the car and the top mounting ears on the differential were hitting the fuel tank and we weren't able to lift it up into the position where it needed to go. So. Right now, the fuel tank is obviously out of the car as well as every other part of the car. We need to get this mounted into the subframe to hold it in place so I can measure what kind of room we have under the car, how much room we have above the diff, and I can't do that until I get it placed into the car. So I cut these out on the plasma table. These will go on the corners and then I'll get sandwiched in between the chassis and here for now. So it's gonna lower the subframe down 3 16 of an inch. We'll weld this square tube across. And I've got this cutout here, allow it to fit over the top of the diff here. I have this plate 
This plate's gonna get welded up here, and that'll give me my mounting points to hold the diff in place. We'll sandwich this thing into the bottom of the chassis, and then we'll be able to see how it looks and how everything fits. I'm really excited that we got the engine stuff figured out as far as the pistons and rods go, and now those are being engineered, and now I can move on with all the chassis fabrication. There's just so much to do. It's good to be working on that again. Whenever you're sitting there, about to go coach a high school football game, and you're number 23 in the state, what do you grab? The Celsius. That's the only thing that keeps me going. You feeling it already? In about three minutes, third gear on the 73, that's when I feel it. Hell yeah. yeah. Amazing to see you guys. Good I love the too. progress on the build. We got the bracket welded up. This is not going to stay in the car, it's just to help us mock this up. We got this bolted on. So that is basically where the diff is going to sit when we do actually fabricate all the mounts. So that is off of our factory measurements of axle center line here and also how the axles were in the car. So where they come through, that's exactly the stock location. Now we can move it a little bit and we can also twist the diff front to back to get the drive shaft angle correct. We'll have to get measured later once we get the engine and transmission in there with the mounts and we figure out the transmission angle because you don't have a lot of room. You can only move the transmission maybe a couple degrees and that affects the angle of the engine as well. Where the differential, we have plenty of room to get the twist or the angle correct and matched to the transmission. This bracket's in my way, so I'm gonna get rid of it. I don't think we needed that anyway. Woo! Hold on. Um, I'm trying to see where it's hitting. It's not hitting on my side. Oh, it's because the car is so angled, so we're hitting the front. Oh, but yeah. the back is not up yet. So let's raise the front of the car too, so we basically level off the chassis. Okay. actually have a pretty good little window right here to be able to look in at how much room we have. Then I'll take some measurements and see if we have enough room to put the fuel cell in the front of the diff, kind of in the factory location. Now obviously it's not gonna be a saddle tank. We'll probably use an eight to maybe a 10 gallon cell at the most because this car won't be run for very long, kind of like a drift car. The tires will be gone before the tank is empty. The car's gonna have to come back in to change tires. We'll fuel it up then. That way we're not carrying around 20 or 24 gallons of fuel that's just completely unnecessary. The design that I wanna do is very much a pro drift car style and not like a pro road race car. It would be with a pro drift car or what we want to use this car for Gymkhana, there is a very good chance that the back of the car is going to get damaged. Sometimes on accident, sometimes on purpose. So if you want to slide up against a wall, raise the wall with the taillights or the bumper or whatever, you're going to do some damage to the quarter panels. You're going to do some damage to the bumpers. And that means the car is going to have to go to a body shop and sit there for a while while they bang it all out and put Bondo or replace parts and quarter panels and all that. And that's not what we want. We want an entire rear quarter panel to be made out of fiberglass or Kevlar or something like that, which will basically flex and move out of the way and then pop right back. And that's how we build the pro drift cars. And it works really well. We actually cut the frame off from a certain point. So on this car, I would say this is a square tube frame rail right here. We would chop this off. We would leave the, the wheel well, cut all of this stuff out, plate this, and then make 
sectional crash bars, basically. So we would build a steel tubing, probably kind of thin wall here, box it, and then make another bumper bar that goes behind that. So it's modular, so you have multiple pieces that can be replaced if you do smash the back of the car. The quarter panels and everything would be actually completely cut off, and the fiberglass or Kevlar or whatever parts would be laid on top where the metal quarter panels used to go. So from the outside, it still looks like a regular car, but when you take the body work off, it looks more like a shell. All the factory sheet metal is basically gone. So that's kind of the idea behind this. We want to move as much of the stuff as possible towards the center of the car and away from the rear end of the car here where it could get damaged. If I do put a fuel cell back here because we don't have room, then I want to make sure the fuel cell can fit in this area and not come back any further than around here. That way we have a decent amount of room for any incidents where, you know, bars get bent in and bashed in and we don't want to damage that fuel cell. So keep it as protected as possible. At a certain point, it kind of is what it is, but we'll do our best to protect key components of the car, the fuel cell, there we have to mount the battery somewhere, the radiator, all that stuff. Any damage to those things and we're basically done. The car is not gonna be running anymore until we replace those parts and fix the damage. So if we can eliminate those issues, and just have cosmetic bodywork back here, that would be ideal. I feel like we have gotten a lot accomplished over the last two days. Ferrari giving us a call, telling us the parts were in, so we got the gasket set that we needed, and it was the last one in the country. And knowing that everybody from Ferrari and basically everyone in Italy is on break for another three weeks, I don't know if we would have gotten the gasket set in time. There's a lot still going on. I need to jump in here and get a lot of measurements so I can figure out the placement of the fuel cell and what size fuel cell we can fit in the car. And that'll determine how we move forward with the radiator placement, also a water pump. There's just so many components that we have to add to the car that were not original Ferrari parts. So I've got a lot of homework to do and I'm gonna get going on it so we can continue on with this project and try to meet our deadline of getting this thing built, done, running at SEMA 2023.